So today is the feast of St. Faustina. So I'm wearing this vestment, which I don't wear very often. It's very bling. I hope it's not blinding the live stream camera. Uh, it's lovely, but it has a picture of St. Faustina on the back, <laughs> which, which you won't see because, yeah, okay. So, uh, so this is her, her, her feast day today. And she's a wonderful saint, an absolutely fantastic saint for our times. Uh, an amazing example in every way because uh, while she was a sister in the convent, even the sisters she lived with had no idea that she was having these mystical experiences. So she was an unknown sister during her life. And as I say, the sisters, like, in a, they lived community life, so they, lived, they couldn't live in closer quarters. Had, they had no idea that the Lord was speaking to her uh, in, in such a profound way. To backtrack just a small bit, uh, she's the third child of 10 born in 1905, so in Poland. Uh, so relatively uneducated. She had three years of, of education, so she could more or less uh, read and write, uh, but very basic education. Because of that, also within the convent then, uh, she got very basic jobs. You know, she'd be the, the porter, she'd answer the door, she'd uh, show people in, that kind of thing. Very simple jobs. but. Growing up, she had this idea, yes, of becoming a sister, felt called, uh, but then a little in her, a little later in her, in her, in her later teens, uh, she discovered dancing and socializing and all of that. So that became somewhat more alluring and tempting. And so uh, she would go out and socialize with, with, with her sister. And on one particular occasion, while out on a dance, so you can imagine the music in the background and people dancing around them, uh, the whole scene just ground to a halt. Everything went dark, except Jesus, who appeared to her after the skirt in a very in a state of great suffering. Um, and he looks at her and he says, how long more do I have to put up with you? How long more will you keep putting me off? Again, words that just struck her to the core. Uh, I mean, you can imagine the Lord in that state saying to you, how long more must I put up with you? How long more will you keep putting me off? And then the, the such music came back. Uh, she saw the different people dancing and just the reality of the futility of what she was doing or maybe the, the, the greatness of her call struck her this need to go and answer the Lord's call. What's interesting, though, is then, okay, she knows that she has a call to be a sister, but what convent? Where? So she went to, to Warsaw, but uh, basically wandered from one convent to the next, knocking on the door, saying, um, I want to be a sister. But we have to keep in mind also that there was a tendency or maybe a danger back in the day as well that uh, in large families, uh, becoming a sister may have actually seemed like a relatively comfortable existence in comparison to home. You know, in a large family, uh, very simple backgrounds, maybe even not a, a whole pile of food, maybe not indoor, probably not indoor plumbing or heating. Uh, becoming a sister might have seemed like a good option. So it may not, it, just because someone presents themselves, it's kind of different today. If someone has, has a vocation, obviously the vocation still have to be tested. But I don't think anybody enters religious life for, the, for a comfortable life. You know, it's great. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's the, so much the, a temptation anymore. But it was back then. So when they would see a, a, you know, a poor girl arriving at the door, they'd be a little sus suspect. You know, is she trying to run away from a poor background or does she actually, does she actually feel called? So anyway, door after door, the answer was, um, it's lovely that you feel called, yeah, but not here, love. Thanks a lot. God bless. And uh, just did not. Uh, so then you can imagine again, Lord, you're calling me, but why, why aren't the doors opening? I mean, I even had a vision. Why isn't this easier? Why isn't this all just coming together? I mean, if, if, if you've called me, why isn't this simpler? And so she knocks on the, the door of another convent, the Congregation of the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy, and says, Hello, Mother Superior, I'm, I feel that I have a call to a religious life, and I'd like to enter. And uh, she says, the, the conversation was very frank, but this woman was quite astute, and behind it all as well, quite, quite prayerful, quite, quite a spiritual Mother Superior. 
And she said, look, we'll, we'll go, we'll pray about it. You know? And so she, she and St. Faustina went and prayed about it. And uh, the Mother Spirit said, okay, well, look, if you still feel called, you can try. And so she entered the Congregation of the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy. The famous, these famous, well, the, 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 the veil now made famous by St. Faustina. If it wasn't for St. Faustina, I'm not sure if any of us would know this, but whenever we have a, an All Saints party and some little, little lady of four or five years of age puts on a veil like that, we go, St. Faustina, immediately. You know, it's, it's, so, in, it's so particular to them. Uh, but that's where she entered then, as a, a very simple sister, doing simple jobs, cooking, cleaning. Um, she wasn't in the best of health, and in her late 20s developed TB, so was quite debilitated, very, quite weakened by that. But she would still do the jobs now if you're cooking back in the day, cooking for a load of sisters, you'd have to lift big pots uh, of potatoes and drain them. And she used to particularly hate that job, just cause, not because she wanted to avoid it, just because she was so physically weak, lifting a big, because you know, you're trying to hold the pot and drain it at the same time, as someone's nodding here, so they obviously know what I'm talking about. So you have to hold onto the lid and then kind of with one hand, kind of tip it without scalding yourself, without dropping the spuds. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, you have to be physically all there. So this was, you know, she was just so weakened by sickness that she, she had this job or, you know, hope it wouldn't kind of fall on her. Um, but she complained to the Lord. She said, Lord, I, just, I want to do this out of love for you, but I just, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I can't do it. The Lord said, whatever you do out of love for me is of infinite value because I unite it to my own love. And so then she, she, she goes with great joy and zeal and, uh, tips the pot and drains off the inside but roses. The idea behind this transforms all. Love transforms everything. Suffered boast about her spiritual experiences to anyone, so nobody knew. So when her sickness then started to, to become more, more well, I won't say more evident, but when it started to affect her, other sisters thought she was just being lazy. Oh, there she is as well, being capricious. She doesn't want to work. She wants to lay down. Typical. Yeah, sure. We should have known better. We should never have taken her. You know, these kind of, these kind of comments. Uh, so, like, comments that would have, would have cut her deeply. But she had a profound love for the Lord. And the Lord, again, the Lord doesn't, as such, reveal his divine mercy to her as if we didn't know. It's very prevalent. Covenant after covenant, the people uh, abandon God, forget God, adore other gods, fall into idolatry, disregard the, the various covenants, and the Lord is always merciful and brings them back. So even in the Old Testament, God is still merciful. So it's not like this is a new thing. But we can always discover ever greater depths of, of his need today. Ireland of the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, I'm not sure if we were very aware of the mercy of God, the God, God of justice, that was very prevalent in our, in our minds, but the mercy of God, not so much, even though say it is in scripture, but we did need to be reminded of this, we do need to be reminded of this, which of course is not a justification, do what you want, it's grand, God's merciful, that, can't do that either, so there, there's a a healthy balance that we have to maintain. Sin is real. Sin is real. God is merciful, absolutely. But he pays for that mercy on the cross. So it's not, while it is a free gift, it wasn't free for him. Forgiving us our sins, God forgiving us our sins, this free gift that we get in confession, wasn't free for, for him, wasn't free for the Lord. He paid for it with his own blood. He paid for it with his life. So you, you don't take a gift like that for granted. Do what you want, it's all fine, God will forgive you. That we shouldn't do, okay? But she wanted to live as a saint and she complained to the Lord uh, that she didn't always succeed. You know, she'd have different tasks. Now she, she never tells us what her, her be big, but the Lord said to her on one occasion, it's number 1,361 in her diary, if you want to read it afterwards, of 1,361. 
This firm resolution to become a saint is extremely pleasing to me. I bless your efforts and I will give you opportunities to sanctify yourself. Be watchful that you lose no opportunity that my providence offers you for sanctification. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. If you do not succeed in taking advantage of an opportunity, your peace. So, if you do not succeed in taking advantage of an opportunity, if you fall, right? So, there's, there's a situation presented to you where you can practice virtue, and for whatever reason, you fall, okay? You, laziness kicks in, pride kicks in, whatever it may be. Uh, if you lose an opportunity, do not lose your peace, but humble yourself profoundly before me, and with great trust, immerse yourself completely in my mercy. In this way, you gain more than you have lost, because more favor is granted to a humble soul than the, than the soul itself asks for. That's just phenomenal. So you have an opportunity to, to, to practice virtue, right? Uh, you, you want to show, there's someone who you find difficult to love, we'll say, and, and they come and just, you just don't love them as you know you should and maybe you're a bit short or a bit snappy and then they leave and you go, oh, mm, I should have, you know, I should have been more loving or compassionate or, or empathetic or should have listened better. Okay, so you've missed the opportunity to, to, to be loving, okay? Do not lose your peace. Humble yourself profoundly before me. And with great trust, immerse yourself completely in my mercy. Okay, so in that moment, you're sitting at the dinner table, you're driving in the car, whatever it may be. You're immersing yourself in God's mercy. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me. I'm, I'm still a work in progress, okay? Help me. Help me to be, to be loving as I should be, to be forgiving as I should be. Uh, in this way, you gain more than you lost. Isn't that incredible? You actually gain more than you lost. It's just, that's just, because more favor is granted to a humble soul than the, than the soul itself asks for. So even, even when, we, when we fail, what, what's important is our reliance on God's mercy, our trust in his mercy. That's what's important. Just beautiful stuff. So th these are the kind of depths of his mercy that we needed to discover. So this isn't, while it is, it's a feast in the church. And so it deserves our, our respect and uh, our attention. Depths of God's mercy for us. Yeah, one last quote from her, considering the present uh, ongoing St. Faustina, who was suffering at the time she wrote this, she writes, the Savior. The greater the suffering, the purer the suffering. Suffering is a consequence of the fall. Death are all a consequence of the We never glorify them, nor do we We've been saying for the last couple of days, love can transform and death, transforming force. These things, a stubbed toe, and, and, like, and, and everything in between. Every cross that we that we may be entrusted with can be transformed with love. So our cross. Things of love who continue to love, and that because anybody can love, but that's what makes us like Christ. So, the cross. so we ask Saint Faustina today, tree of divine mercy, to remind us each. afforded us to become saints, to live out of his mercy even when we fail, to humbly approach him, to approach this, this vessel of divine mercy and draw from the graces of his heart with our trust. We pray that 
each one of us may become apostles of divine mercy in our own right. We pray that Ireland will be protected from euthanasia, that the transforming power of love may be experienced by everyone who suffers. Amen. Thank you.